to find the center of the circle, it's going to be the midpoint between those two points. Um, so what I'm going to do first, is just so we can kind of understand what we're working with here, I'm going to go ahead and plot where those points are approximately. So negative 2, 3, approximately here, and 8, negative 5. over here somewhere. So I would expect the center to be somewhere in here-ish, right? Well, maybe that's not exactly in the center, but anyhow, you can kind of see what I mean. Um, you expect the center to be halfway between those two points. So what we want to do to find the midpoint is we want to find the midpoint between these two x values. So I would take, so the midpoint will be negative 2 plus 8 divided by 2. So you just average the x values. And then you are going to average the y values, and that will give you the point right in the middle. Okay, and so if I do that, I'm going to get negative 2 plus 8 is 6 over 2, which is 3. And 3 plus negative 5 is negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. So there's my um, midpoint is at 3, negative 1. So there's the center of my circle. And then if I want to find the radius, that's going to be the distance from the center to one of the points here. So to find that distance, I can use the distance formula, which is essentially the same thing as the Pythagorean theorem. So the distance is going to be the square root of the change in x. So um, if I'm using this one, so it would be um, 8 minus 3 squared plus... Um, and then the change in y. So that would be negative 5 minus 3 squared. Or sorry, negative 5 minus 1 squared minus negative 1 squared. So that gives me d is equal to the square root of 25 plus um, 16. So d is equal to the square root of 41. And that's the radius of the circle. So next, I want to, given that equation, the first thing I want to do is determine if that ordered pair is a solution. So what I'm going to do is plug in uh, negative 3 for x and 2 for y. So I have 4 times the absolute value of negative 3 minus 1 plus 2. And what does that give me? Well, um, that's 4 times the absolute value of negative 4 plus 2. So the absolute value of negative 4 is 4. So that's 16 plus 2, which is 18. So that one works. Okay, let's try the next one. Determine if 5, negative 2 is a solution. So I'm going to plug in 5 for x and negative 2 for y. So I have 4 times the absolute value of 4 minus 2. So that's 16 minus 2, so that's 14. So that one does not work. Graph the equation um, 1 half x plus 2y equals 10 by plotting points. Um, use a table of values to determine the points to plot. So to do this one, what I'm going to do is first put it in slope-intercept form. So I have 2y is equal to negative 1 half x plus 10. And then I'm going to divide everything through by 2. So y equals negative 1 fourth x plus plus 5. And so if I want to graph this, I know my intercept, my y-intercept is 5, and my slope is negative 1 fourth. So I can plot the point 0, 5. 
and then I can plot, and then I, um, since the slope is negative one fourth, that means down one and to the right four. And so there's my line like that. Find the x and y intercepts of the following equations. Show all work. Okay, so on the first one, I can see that um, <laughs> to find the x intercepts. Well, if I'm looking for where it crosses the x axis, I want to set y equal to zero because that's what happens on the x axis. So I'll have negative 3 equals, uh, sorry, negative 3x equals 60 if I plug in y for, 0 for y. And so I'll have x is equal to negative 60 divided by 3, so negative 20. Um, and for the y-intercept, I want to set x equal to 0. Because on the y-axis, all the x values are 0. So if I do that, then I have negative 5y equals 60, and I divide by negative 5, and I get y is equal to negative 6. Negative 12. Sorry. 60 divided by 5 is 12. Okay. And so those are the um, x-intercepts of that. And then if I want to do problem B, So for the x-intercept, I want to set y equal to 0. So if I do that, I get 0 is equal to absolute value of x plus 4 minus 3. So I can add 3 over. 3 is equal to absolute value of x plus 4. And this breaks into two equations. I have x plus 4 equals negative 3 and x plus 4 equals 3 which this gives me x is equal to negative 1, and this one gives me x is equal to negative 7. So I have two x-intercepts there. And then for the y-intercept, I want to set x equal to 0. And so if I do that, I get y is equal to absolute value of 4 minus 3, which is 1. Okay, last one. I have... Um, x is equal to y squared minus 4. So to find my x-intercept, I want to set y equal to 0. So I get x equal negative 4. And for my y-intercept, I want to set x equal to 0. So that gives me 0 is equal to y squared minus 4. So y squared equals 4. So y is equal to plus or minus 2. For the next one, I want to find the x and y intercept and use those intercepts to graph the equation. So for the x intercept, I want to let y equal to 0. So I get 3x equals 24, so x equals 8. So there's my x-intercept on my graph. And for the y-intercept, I want to let x equal 0. So I get negative 4y equals 24. And so y is equal to negative 6. So there's my y-intercept. And then I can draw the graph of the line. Oops! Oh no! I erased it! And I can draw the graph of the line through there. Then it says, determine if the function defines y as a function of x. So to tell if it defines y as a function of x, that means that every x value needs to map to only one y value. So on A, I can look for the vertical line test, and I can see if for a given x value, does it hit the graph only once, and this is a function. 
Um, this one, I have an issue because negative 6 maps to two different values. So this one is not a function. Okay, the next one, I can see x squared plus y minus 3 equals 4. So that gives me y is equal to, um, so if I add the 3 over and subtract the x squared, I get negative x squared plus, uh, sorry, plus 7. And so that is a function. So b is a function, a is a function. And for the last one, I have um, something like that. So I get um, y squared minus 6y. Um, is equal to negative x squared plus 13. Okay, so this one is not going to define a function because for a given x value, it can have two different y values because of that y squared. So this one's not a function um, because it has a, a y squared in there. For the next one, I'm, I'm given a function, and I want to evaluate f of negative 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in negative 3 everywhere I see an x. So I'll have 2 times negative 3 squared minus 3 times negative 3 plus 1. So that's 2 times 9 is 18 uh, plus 9 plus 1. So that gives me 28. And now I want to plug x minus 2 in everywhere I see an x. So I want to do 2 times x minus 2 squared minus 3 times x minus 2 plus 1. And then you can simplify from here. So when I square something like x minus 2, I have to multiply x minus 2 times x minus 2. So I'll get x squared minus 4x plus 4 minus 3 times x minus 2 plus 1. Then I want to go ahead and distribute that to 2x squared minus 8x plus 8 minus 3x plus 6 plus 1. So you end up getting 2x squared minus 11x plus 15. For the next one, I want to write the domain of the following functions in interval notation. For, for this one, I have the only issue I'm going to have is in the denominator, x cannot equal negative 7. So if I draw that on a number line, what I really want is I want to represent that you can be any value except for negative 7. So if I wrote that in interval notation, that would be negative infinity to negative 7 union. 7, sorry, negative 7 to infinity. And I'm using um, parentheses because I don't want to include the end point there. The negative 7 should be left out, um, and then I can write it in interval notation, notation in that way. Um, for this next one, the issue will be when the denominator is 0. So that's when absolute value of x equals 3. So that happens when x equals 3 and when x equals negative 3. So I want to leave those two values out of my domain. So I will write open circles there and then I'll fill in all the other numbers are okay. So this will end up being in three pieces. So I'll have negative infinity to negative 3, union, negative 3 to 3, union, 3 to infinity. For the next one, um, this is a polynomial, so it should be defined for any value of x. Any value of x that I plug in, I should be able to square it, uh, multiply it by negative 5, and add 3. Um, so, so that all of the operations going on there will be fine, so this is negative infinity to infinity is the domain for that function. Um, square root functions are only defined when the stuff underneath here is 0 or it's positive. So what I need to have is 4 minus x needs to be greater than or equal to 0. So that means that um, if I add the x over 
I get x is less than or equal to 4. So if I were to draw that on a number line, I could draw 4 in here, and I want everything less than or equal to 4 will be where the function is defined. So that gives me negative infinity to 4, and I want a closed bracket on that because I want to include that endpoint. And so on the solutions that you were passed out, it has a parentheses, but it should be a bracket because um, if you plug in 4 into that function, you'll get 4 minus 4, which is just the square root of 0. And the square root of 0 is defined. The square root of 0 is 0. So 4 should be included in the domain. Okay, so for the next one, I want to use the graph to determine different values. So f of negative 2, that means I want to find the y value when x is negative 2. So f of negative 2 is negative 2. f of 3 means I want to find the y value when x is 3. So when x is 3, I go down here, and my value is negative 1. Then I want to find all x for which f of x is negative 1. So I want to think about when the y value is negative 1. So that's here and here. So that's x equal negative 1 and x equal 3. Um, the next one, I want to find all x for which f of x is negative 4. So that seems to happen here, and it looks like on the right-hand side, it um, levels off here. So it doesn't actually go down to negative 4 there. So there's really only one place where the function hits the value negative 4, and that happens when x equal negative 4. Then determine the x-intercepts. So the x-intercepts are these two points, so x equals 0 and 2. Determine the y-intercept, so where it crosses the y-axis is at x equals 0, or you could write it as the point 0, 0. Then determine the domain of f, so the domain will be all the x values for which the function is defined, so that should be all the x values, so from negative infinity to infinity. And determine the range of f, well, f hits um, what y values does it attain? So it attains all the y values up to the biggest y value that it attains is 1. So the range will be um, negative infinity to 1. And I want to include the 1, so I'll have a bracket there on 1 because it is defined when x equals, or sorry, when x equals 1, the y value is 1. Determine the slope of the line passing through those points. So the slope formula has an x1, y1, and x2, y2. So the slope is going to be the change in y over the change in x. So in other words, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And we can plug in the values that were given there. So that gives me um, negative 6 minus 4 over negative 1 minus negative 9. So that gives me negative 10 over 8. So that should give me negative 5 fourths. And as I'm looking at the answer key, it seems like it has a positive 5 fourths, but that is a typo. It should be negative 5 fourths. Because if you think about where the points are on the plane, um, negative 9, 4 is up here, and um, negative 1, negative 6 is down here, and so that is a line with a negative slope, so the slope should be negative 5 fourths. On number 11, write the equations in slope-intercept form if possible, and determine the slope and y-intercept. Okay, so, so for part A, um, I'll just try to get the y by itself. So we have, um, so I'll add the 6 over, so I get 3y is equal to 5x plus 6, and then I can divide by 3, so I get y is equal to 5 thirds x plus 2. And so this is the slope, and this is the y-intercept. Um, so the slope is 5 thirds, and the y-intercept 
is 0, 2. On B, I can get the y by itself. So I get negative 6y equals 12 minus 3x. And then I can divide by negative 6. So I'm going to get y is equal to 12 divided by negative 6 is, pop, is negative 2. And when I do negative 3 divided by negative 6, I get positive 1 half x. So the slope is 1 half, and the y-intercept is 0, negative 2. On part C, um, I get, oh, well, this one I, I get um, 3y is equal to 19 minus 7 is 12. So I get y equals 4. So the slope is 0, and the y-intercept is 0, 4. That's just a constant function at 4. <coughs> On D, um, there is no y. So I get 2x is equal to negative 4. So x is equal to negative 2. So this cannot be written. in slope intercept form. And if I think about that, that's because this is the function x equal negative 2. And that's just going to be a vertical line at negative 2. So the slope is undefined there. OK, so for the next one, I want to write the equation of a line in slope intercept form that passes through those two points. So the first thing I want to do is find the slope. So to find the slope, I'm going to set um, do the change in y over the change in x. So 1 minus negative 3 over 4 minus 7. So that gives me positive 4 over negative 3. And then I can use my point slope form. Uh, wait, it wants it in slope intercept form. So um, so I can write y equals mx plus b, so negative 4 thirds x plus b. And to solve for b, I want to plug in my x and y um, values for x and y that I know are on the line. And so I can plug in 1 equals negative 4 thirds times 4 plus b. And so when I do that, I get... Um, 1 and I get negative 16 thirds, so I get b is equal to um, 3 thirds plus 16 thirds, which is 19 thirds. So I get y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 19 thirds. Okay, on the very last one, determine the average rate of change on that function from the interval on the interval 1, 3. So when it talks about the interval like this, what it really means is that 1 and 3 are both x values. So I want to go from x equal 1 to x equal 3. So, um, so when x equal 1, my function is... 2 times 1 squared plus 2, which is 4. And when x equal 3, I have f of 3 is equal to 2 times 3 squared plus 2. So 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18, 19, 20. So that's 20. And so these are my two points. So, um, so to determine, to determine the average rate of change, that's going to be the change in f over the change in x. So this is f of 3 minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. So f of 3 we've decided is 20 minus 4 over 
3 minus 1. So that gives me 16 over 2, which is 8.